Welcome to Realty Talk, the show that brings together the country's most authoritative and respected property experts. Follow us on all the socials and subscribe for updates and exclusive offers. Realty Talk is powered by realty.com.au, connecting buyers, sellers and agents differently. Hi and welcome to another big year with another big Realty Talk show here on your property hub. And we start the year with some great news. Following on from the success of the Property Hub that combines Realty Talk and the long-form Get Invested podcast, our partnership with National Award-winning Podcast of the Year Network, DM Media, that's attracted more than 520,000 listeners and 1.2 million monthly downloads via the Nova Network, has now been taken to the next level as we quite proudly join Southern Cross Osterio's listener platform, who we believe are the most innovative and successful players in the Australian digital audio space, which means more benefits, more industry-leading guests, and better shows for you as a loyal Property Hub follower. This further strengthens the Property Hub's position as your go-to home for property investment insights, inspiration, and stories from Australia's top property experts, leaders, and analysts. I'm your anchor, Bushy Martin from Know How Property Finance, and this week's show gets the year underway with an absolute all-star collection of industry-leading guests. Show founder Kevin Turner kicks things off by completing our eight-part special auction summer series with buyer's agent Kate Bakos by revealing common misconceptions about auctions. Pete Wargent then joins me to uncover the impacts that rapidly rising population growth is going to have on the future of property and the opportunities that this is going to create. Buyer's agent Michael Roger then cuts through our in, inbuilt bias and gut feel guesses by utilising Prop Hero's sophisticated AI to unveil the property threats and opportunities in the days ahead. And to end the show on a high, legendary investor and author of his new bestseller, Money Magnet, Steve McKnight, joins us to reveal cash flow positive property benefits and opportunities. Now, before we get into it, Make sure you don't miss another episode of Realty Talk by subscribing to the Property Hub on your favourite podcast player, where you'll get two powerful episodes of both Realty Talk as well as the Get Invested podcast delivered to you each and every week. And make sure you also sign up on the realty.com.au homepage, where you'll also get a free copy of my award-winning book, Get Invested, just for making the effort. We've got some absolute treasure trove of property gold to share. so. Let's get underway. Hello, once again, in this series, uh, we're talking all about auctions and I'm joined uh, by someone who's very skilled, knows all about auctions, Kate Bakos, is a buyer's agent, uh, katebakos.com.au, if you want to get more information about what Kate does. But you know, one of the things that that struck me is that many people, and I'm an agent, so I've had to talk to sellers about uh, and buyers about buying a property or selling a property at auction there are there are a number of misconceptions a number of um, myths about auction and how it works Kate Bakos is joining me to dispel just a few of those and make you feel more comfortable if you have to get along and bid at an auction in the next couple of weeks or in fact if you're looking at selling your property by auction Kate welcome to the show and thanks for your time again G'day Kevin it's great to be here uh, Kate, what have you found are some of the more uh, common misconceptions that you'd just like to talk about now? Yeah, uh, a lot of people assume that when you go to auction, you're bidding unconditionally. Now, you are bidding without a three-day cooling off. We all know that. Uh, in, in the various states, that, that changes a little bit, but no cooling off in Victoria for three days either side of a public auction. But it doesn't mean that you are bidding unconditionally if you've asked special permission and been granted some conditions. Now, it is rare, and they're probably not likely to agree to something like a finance clause or a building and pest inspection clause, but there might be other little conditions that you've asked for, such as if you're an investor, being allowed to use the photos to advertise it prior to settlement for rental and being able to run some people through before you settle. Or it might be something like moving in earlier before settlement on what we call a licence agreement if you're wanting to um, inhabit the property before you settle. So there are all kinds of little conditions that aren't uncommon for vendors and agents and vendor solicitors to agree to. 
So it doesn't mean that you can't have conditions. It just means that you have to pre-organise them and get permission. That's one of the first ones. Yeah, and, and even the settlement time um, can be varied as well, can't it, Kate? Doesn't it have to be 30 or 45 days? That's right. So when the auctioneer stands out the front and says, whatever days are on offer, we often hear 30, 60, 90. That doesn't mean that you're bound to, to slotting into one of those three. You can pre-arrange any settlement date that you can agree on before the auction. And the same goes for the deposit. You might not have a checkbook. A lot of younger buyers don't carry around checkbooks and so they might be familiar with an EFT or they might wish to put down a small holding deposit and then go to the bank on Monday and sort out the balance. Or for some buyers who don't have 10% on hand, they might be granted um, a special request where they can just proceed with 5%. So everything is negotiable. We just have to remember that we can't negotiate on Saturday. We, we do have to get our, ourselves in order and organise any variations to what's on offer prior to the auction. And we need to understand that the agent will probably want the vendor and the vendor solicitor to agree to this and solicitor's offices close at five o'clock, we all know that. So we need to get our ducks in a row and organise variations well before the end of Friday. And, and I think we need to understand too that when we do ask for special conditions, uh, that if they're granted, it, because it's a level playing ground, they also have to be made available to other bidders as well, Kate? That's a really interesting um, question and, and it's come up many times before in the past. In some states, that, that is the fact. Uh, in Victoria, we don't need it to be announced what the variations are. We just need it to be announced that there might be others in the crowd who have alternate terms. They they can't reasonably reject someone having matching terms, but it doesn't necessarily have to be announced in your state. If, if a bidder uh, under those circumstances, and this is a question without notice, if a bidder were to say, well, what are those conditions? Are we allowed to know? Should they be disclosed? Yeah, I believe they should. And I think it would be very unlikely that an agent wouldn't come forward in the crowd and talk one-on-one -on -one with that person. Bearing in mind the auction is probably rolling, so they're not about to stop the auction to, to debrief someone on someone else's arrangements. But if, if it means that they'll encourage another bidder, I would confidently say that most agents would say, if you need those um, those variations too, let's talk about it. But sometimes when we have asked for variations, we've been requested to deliver some proof that we're a reliable bidder. So, for example, if it's a 5% um, deposit down, the agent may say that the vendor's willing to consider your request, but they'd really like to see your pre-approval letter or something like that. So in, in a situation where you've provided evidence to back up your request, it might not be on offer to someone else and the agent might simply say, I'm sorry, it's too late notice. Yeah, gee, that's, a, that's a, a very good point. Can I just swing the table a bit and get away from buyers and talk about sellers in a moment? One of the uh, popular misconceptions that I've found over the years is that many sellers believe if they go to auction, they just have to take whatever's offered to them on the day. Um, you know, there is a reserve. Maybe you could just quickly talk us through the reserve process. Um, how, f how firm is that? And, you know, what, what rights does the seller have to refuse an offer during auction? A seller is, is bound to state their reserve before the auction starts. And they may wish to move that reserve, so bring it down um, at the halftime show, as we call it. So if they haven't hit reserve, and the agents will go inside for that mid-auction debrief and then come out. They have the right to move their reserve. But if they don't hit reserve at auction, they're not bound to take the best offer. It's, it's their property and it's their rules. They can hold out for a new buyer to come into the mix or they can hold out for the highest bidder to be prepared to increase their offer. Now, the, their willingness to accept an offer will be based on two things. Firstly, their own current set of circumstances. So if they have to sell and they've got time pressure, they'll probably be more amenable to a disappointing offer. And also the agent's recommendations in light of the market situation. So if we're in a really strong seller's market and they've had a disappointing auction outcome, the agent might say, this was a bit of a surprise and we're, we're disappointed for you, but in the face of the market that we're dealing with, we recommend that you hold out because we think we can find another buyer or we can work with this current buyer and get you a better offer. 
So if it's a really tough market, though, the agent might say, look, we got it wrong and what we thought was there isn't there and we're pretty confident that this might be the best offer you could get. So when it's a collaborative conversation and the agent's providing the vendor with market sentiment and their own thoughts on the campaign, it really is up to the vendor. Well spoken, Kate. Thank you so much. There's uh, so much for us to learn and uh, we could talk to you for hours, but uh, we're out of time for now. Kate Bacos is a buyer's agent. You can reach her at her website, katebacos.com.au. Kate, thanks again for your time. It's been a blast. Thank you so much. Property deductions can save you thousands of dollars each year. To make sure you maximise deductions, you need to work with the most experienced quantity surveyor in the country. BMT Tax Depreciation is the leading specialist in the industry. They've completed over 700,000 tax deduction schedules for residential investment and commercial properties Australia-wide. BMT guarantee to find double your fee in the first full financial year deductions. Call BMT on 1300 728 726 today for an obligation free quote. After a lengthy period of closed international borders, population growth hasn't been in the muse much of late. So you may be interested to learn that Australia's population clock has just ticked over 26 million. And as the nation is now enjoying full employment with a genuine skill shortage, on top of the fact that COVID's reinforced that our great nation is one of the best and safest places to live and work around the world, immigration growth is right back on the agenda. So to dig into likely population growth and its impact on property, we're joined by one of Realty Talk's most popular regulars, Pete Wargent from Buyers Buyers, who's one of the country's leaders buying ag- leading buyers agents. He's a finance and real estate expert, a multiple published author, and an all-round property and investment guru. So welcome back to the show, Pete. Thanks, Bushy. What an intro. Yeah, great to be on as always. Yeah, thanks, mate. Uh, interesting subject, uh, given what's about to occur. So sort of set the scene, how much does Australia's population grow naturally every year and what are the key drivers that contribute to that? Yeah, it's interesting. It's a bit counterintuitive because um, a lot of people used to talk years ago about population shrinking as the baby boomer generation faded away or moved on. But in Australia's case, that's nowhere near the uh, the case. Um, it's actually very different because we've run a very large uh, migration program, uh, particularly through the mining boom years, but also over the past decade as well. Uh, we've actually uh, not got a top heavy population. Our immigration program has largely been focused on uh, 18 to 30 year olds, uh, including myself, you know, people coming in on skilled visas. So we actually yeah. have many more births than deaths in Australia to the extent that. Uh, the population naturally grows by about 150,000 per annum. Um, yep. And it's also a very uh, strong demographic pyramid. We're not top heavy at all. We've got lots of young, skilled migrants who want to come here. Um, and uh, the fertility rate was down a bit for a while, but it bounced back last year, maybe a, um, a derivative of the pandemic, who knows. But um, yeah, generally speaking, look, about 150,000 per annum, the population grows anyway. And that's before you think about all of that migration coming in. Yeah, interesting. So uh, put it in context then, what's the recent federal budget projecting in terms of overseas migration? So the skilled um, or the permanent visa uh, program has been increased to a record high. So we used to have 160,000 per annum. Um, We're now, uh, the the migration cap has been lifted to 195,000 per annum. We've also got temporary visas, things like international students, working holiday makers, We've got um, other visa classes as well, uh, and also visitors. So there's a lot of different moving parts. If you look at net overseas migration in the budget, well, it's a record high. Uh, As far as the projections go out to the end of the horizon, about 235,000 per annum every year. But historically, we've always underestimated immigration into Australia, at least until the pandemic. Um, So I wouldn't be at all surprised if you see record high population growth over the next four or five years. Yeah, interesting. You've covered off on the, the temporary visa component already. So uh, what impact is all of this going to have on property? And, and in that context, what locations and types of properties are likely to be most affected, do you think, Pete? Yeah, well, the, the temporary visa um, thing is very interesting. Before the pandemic, we had about 2.3 million temporary visa holders. 
And then there was an enormous drop. A lot of people just disappeared. We weren't getting the new people coming in, international yep. students, working holiday makers. All of this has shown up um, largely in a shortage of available labour. So if you go to cafes or retail outlets, you can see adverts everywhere. We need staff. I went to a place in Malula Bar recently advertising for a head chef and waitresses and uh, people to work on the counter, you know, just in one one outlet. So that's now changing. People are coming back into the country. Um, about 503,000 is the year-on-year -year increase. So the rebound has been massive. Um, and in fact, if you just exclude the visitor uh, visas, which are down a bit, we're actually back to record highs. So um, this is going to, from a housing market perspective, is going to show up in particularly in rental markets because yeah. new arrivals into Australia, they don't arrive and buy property on day one. Yeah. Thinking myself, when I arrived as a young backpacker, the first thing you do is look for somewhere to rent. So we're going to see a rental shortage. In fact, we're already seeing that <laughs> and increasingly so in Sydney and Melbourne. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's good. So flowing on beyond that, and let, let's let's jump a couple of years down the track once they've into jobs and they're putting some money away and they're, they're starting to look at property. Uh, it, it might be too early to tell, but any thoughts on the sorts of types of property and locations that are going to benefit from that influx? Yeah, I think, um, look, it's granular. In New South Wales, um, the Premier Perite has passed um, after many years of talking about it, stamp duty reform for first home buyers. Uh, so up to the $1.5 million price point in New South Wales, um, first home buyers from 16th of January will be able to opt to not pay stamp duty and instead pay an annual uh, land tax effectively or property tax. Um, so just the, for the sake of round numbers, a million dollar purchase, you used to hand over $40,000 of stamp duty. Now you can opt to pay um, a couple of thousand dollars per annum as an annual tax. And the research shows most first time buyers will go for that option. It's like the old marshmallow test. Um, and yeah. that will actually bring a lot of demand into the housing market in New South Wales, but underneath the $1.5 million cap, yes. um, there might be a bit of a two speed market going on over the next year or two. Yeah, yeah, that makes complete sense. So, uh, given all of that, uh, in your from your perspective, what and where will the best investment opportunities that arise out of this be? Do you think? Well, there's been a, a definite shift in terms of um, how and where people live over the past two or three years, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, yeah. I think a lot of the locations. I think um, generally speaking, the demographers tend to agree. Um, a lot the, the regional markets that will benefit the most are often those that are within the gravitational pull of the capital cities. Uh, yeah. So people might not be in the office five days a week anymore, but if they're going to need to be in one or two days, they still want to be within 90 minutes, two hours of the capital cities. Yeah. Uh, so straight away, you can think of the sorts of cities that applies to. It's uh, Toowoomba, Gold Coast, uh, down in Victoria. Uh, you, you would know places like Geelong and Bendigo and Ballarat. New yeah. South Wales has its own peri-urban locations, Wollongong, Central Coast, and so on. And so I think a lot of the opportunities will be there. Prices have come off a bit in some cases as interest rates have increased. Uh, generally speaking, good houses, good blocks of land, close to the amenities, you know, there's the sorts of properties that tend to do well with the high land-to-asset ratio. Yeah, perfectly said, mate. Look, uh, really appreciate you taking the time to share these insights with us again today, Pete, and thanks again for your time on the show today. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Bushy. Thanks, mate. Well, as you've just heard, a tsunami of population growth is rapidly heading towards us as we currently sit in the doldrums of the upcoming property storm. And for those of you who have the foresight and still have the means, there's going to be some great investment opportunities in the days ahead. So if you're looking for a great quality information to better inform your property journey, jump on buyersbuyers.com.au now, where Pete's national network of buyers agents can help you secure your next property for a highly competitive price. Stay tuned for more on your Property Hub's trusted voice for all things property, here on Realty Talk. Successful property investment is a game of finance. Do you have the right team and the right game plan? Realty Talk is brought to you by Know How Property. More than mortgage brokers, Bushy Martin and his team of investment architects set you up with a sustainable strategy structured to lower your costs, tax, risk and stress while increasing your capacity for growth. 
Know-how has helped over 1,900 homeowners and investors secure more than $800 million in property wealth. So get set to live more, work less, and live your legacy. Want to know how to invest in your freedom? Visit knowhowproperty.com.au. To say that property is a complex, dynamic, and constantly variable asset class is a massive understatement. Yet many try to oversimplify property's complexity into rough linear models to make big dollar decisions, or worse still, just rely on gut feel. So it's no wonder that most misread the situation and don't achieve the results that they're actually looking for. The media's straight line extrapolation of rising interest rates causing property values to fall is a good current example. It's just not that simple. So how do you overcome our inbuilt biases and our emotional responses to better understand what's really happening with property conditions in order to make much better informed property decisions? Well, you need to turn to the exciting world of artificial intelligence that can quickly and easily interrogate multitudes of data and volumes of variables, and Prop Heroes buyers agents are leading this charge. So to share what the data is actually saying about what's really happening with property conditions around the country, we're joined by the co-founder of Prop Hero, Michael Roger. So welcome back to Realty Talk, Michael. Thanks, great to be here. Great to see you again. Now, Michael, uh, just to kick things off, what data does Prop Hero use to help determine current and future property conditions? Yeah. So look, quick background uh, about me, Bushi. So before Prop Hero, I spent over 10 years in the data and AI world, most recently at McKinsey, where I was leading their AI practice. And uh, we launched Prop Hero with the absolute uh, certainty that data and artificial intelligence are going to completely transform the real estate industry. So at Prop Hero, we use, uh, so we track over 15,000 suburbs in Australia. We have over 200 variables, uh, over 1 billion data points that we are using that are both backward and forward looking. And to give you an idea, right? So like some of the uh, uh, more advanced things that we look at, uh, we look at uh, the impact of uh, leading ind indicators for macroeconomics and population growth, how this impacts uh, uh, future capital gains, how gentrification, how you can find early signs of gentrification, uh, how you can also use uh, climate change data to identify which areas you really don't want to, to invest and which area you really want to invest. So yeah, over 200 variables and multiple variations of these variables, over 1 billion data points. And yeah, and that's how we uh, identify our top areas and top properties to buy. Yeah, it's uh, certainly turning into a, a science that's uh, giving you uh, relative data that's, that's current and that, that's certainly been missing for the industry for a long while. So, so tell us, what's your data telling you in relation to what's really happening in the property market right now? So uh, I think four uh, main insights, uh, Bushi. Number one is that, yes, the, mar the market is going down on average, but not everywhere. And as a fact, last quarter, over 40% of suburbs went up. No one talks about it, right? But 40% of suburbs went up last quarter, right? Including our of course. Uh, number two is that there is a massive supply issue in Australia right now. Uh, vacancies are at an all-time low at 0.8%. In Adelaide, where we've been buying for the past nine months, it's 0.2%. There is just not enough properties and too many people. And it's even more now with uh, uh, new bills going down because of inflation and immigration uh, starting again. So massive uh, supply constraints leaning to my third point, which is something completely new in the market is how rents are going to the roof in some areas. Uh, in most of our areas, I checked on average, the rents in areas where we bought increased by 19% over the past 12 months, 19%. That's almost three times the rate of inflation. Yeah. And the issue with that, of course, many uh, terrible challenges for the people living there, right? And I think this has been pushed by many things, lack of supply, RBA rates as well, that, have put, that has put massive pressure on landlords. And so that's like a big thing. Also a massive opportunity for smart investors, right? Because in a world of inflation, some markets uh, will significantly underperform and mechanically some markets will significantly outperform inflation, which is what we are seeing right now. The first thing we are seeing in the data is that climate change is already affecting property prices in Australia. 
And I don't think we really speak about it. I know that Bushi, we talked about it one year ago and I was thinking, hey, you know, like this is what we're seeing. Now it's a fact, right? It is a fact. Property market is being affected by climate change. You know, so we've bought, I don't know, dozens and dozens of properties around the country, actually probably hundreds. Zero uh, percent have been affected by floods, droughts or bushfires. Not because of luck, just because we actually check for this risk. And I think that soon, Australian investors re re will realize that it will only get worse and some areas will become unlivable. And it means that uh, no tenants, no, no one to buy your property, insurance prices going to the roof. And so people will just flee these areas. On the contrary, on the flip side, if you find the right areas, you will find this uh, perfect location that is not too much uh, affected by climate change. And this is not like prospective in the future, 5, 10, 20 years. This is happening today. And this is a fact now. Uh, 100% agree with you. I, we're, we're currently on the hunt for a property ourselves. And, and one of the underlying criteria is uh, areas that aren't going to be affected by climate change. So 100%. Uh, and you, you make a, a really good point around the 40% of areas that are increasing in value. And this is the, the big issue when the mainstream media talks about property markets that don't really exist. And they rely just on median prices. Exactly. What it tends to do is cover the, the variables in below that. Uh, exactly. We're seeing uh, particular precincts and areas are actually going contrary to what the, the medium's telling them. So exactly. uh, really good information there. So uh, drawing that all together then, Michael, uh, what threats and opportunities is your data revealing and, and what do we need to be doing about it? Yeah. So uh, there is one. So I think there are like... Uh, four main threats and, and opportunities. The first one, I don't think you and me uh, can do much about it, but it's the RBA panicking again. And I think that the policy, well, uh, has been like highly uh, stressful for most Australians. And I think that what the market needs now is stability and confidence, right? And I think that the RBA is like slowly starting to realize this, but I think this is like really needed uh, in the country. Second risk that I see is that what we are seeing now in the market is that, you know, so we, we are not biased again by uh, about anything. So we really uh, analyze any property. We have seen in our data that on average of the planned properties tend to underperform uh, existing properties. Uh, of course, you have exceptions everywhere. And if you know like uh, the right person, you can find a great deal, but on average, they underperform. What we're seeing now is that some developers are under so much pressure that we are seeing some very questionable behaviors. And we are seeing some of our clients come to us and say, hey guys, I made this terrible mistake. I bought this, pro this uh, brand new property and we're having so many issues. So one maybe thing to people listening to us is just like be extra cautious if you're going this path because we are seeing some really questionable behaviors there. We've talked about climate change and uh, we are lucky in Australia. We have the uh, Climate Council that provides free mapping tools to check uh, scenarios of the impact of climate change on the property market, right? So please, uh, it's free to use. Just check online, Climate Change Australia. Uh, it's free to use. It's really easy. Uh, and if you're buying by yourself, like it's uh, at least some uh, risk reduction that you will find there. Sp speaking of opportunities, uh, in a world of inflation, there is a way to win in property. And you are going to win if you find an area that is able to beat inflation. And how do you beat inflation is if you're able to attract the remaining owner occupiers and investors and steal this market share of investors from other areas. And if you have the right demographics and affordability to make uh, your rental yield go up faster than inflation and interest rates, right? And so where we buy now, uh, Bushi is areas with yield above 4%, with rent going at least twice the pace of inflation that are significantly below uh, the uh, peak. Uh, and of course, that are like very, very far from these uh, climate risk areas. And what we believe is that if you invest in these areas, you are quite significantly likely to outperform the market, right? And so, and that's pretty clear in the data. And actually, when you look at the past decades uh, of data, it's pretty clear that in, a, in times of inflation, some property markets actually go up, while some others that are much less attractive actually keep going down quite significantly.
Yeah, that's a very good read. There's always opportunity if you know where to look and, and what to look for. So, uh, look, I really appreciate you uh, sharing these very timely insights with us, Michael, and thanks again for your time on the show today. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Michael. Well, the evidence is clear here. To give yourself a leg up and overcome your own limitations and other, other people's best guesses, when it comes to making better informed property decisions, you need to turn to independent professionals with access to big, da big data algorithms complemented by a national network of local property experts like Michael and the Prop Hero Buyers Agents team, which you can find at prophero.com.au. Keep watching the Property Hub's Realty Talk, your go-to place for all things property. Property depreciation is the natural wear and tear of a building and its assets. Property investors can claim depreciation as a tax deduction each financial year. Depreciation is a non-cash deduction. This means you don't need to spend any money in order to claim it. On average, BMT tax depreciation find residential investors almost $9,000 in first full financial year deductions. Call BMT on 1300 728 726 today for an obligation free quote. And given the COVID catalyst impact on pouring petrol on the fire of property values across the country over the last couple of years, a lot of investors are questioning whether it's still possible to find positive cash flow properties. So to help you with this, we're joined by Australia's positive cash flow king, whose first best-selling book from naught to 130 properties in three and a half years set the standard for how to use the power of positive cash flow property so you never have to work again. And he took this to a new level. And this seminal work has positively influenced the impact on the lives of millions of hardworking Aussies over the last 20 years. And if you haven't guessed already, we're talking about the legendary Steve McKnight. And he's just released his next bestseller, Money Magnum, How to Attract and Keep a Fortune That Counts. So as a multiple bestselling author, a self-made multimillionaire and generous philanthropist, welcome back to the show, Steve. Thanks, Bushy. Hello, everyone. Steve, uh, I really want to get stuck into this so because uh, it's a great and very pertinent subject in the context of what's happening at the moment. Uh, so uh, let's start with the obvious question. Can you still find positive cash flow properties? And if so, how and where? That's a good question, Bushy. Do you want to start by having a quick chat about what a positive cash flow property is, just in case there's anyone out there who's thinking, what are we talking about today? Right, yeah. So when you buy a piece of real estate, you can make money out of it by going up in value, capital gains, or you can make money out of it if the rent is higher than the expenses. So a positive cash flow property, as opposed to a negative cash flow property, is one where the amount of money that comes in from the rent is greater than the amount of money that goes out from the expenses. And a negative cash flow property is the opposite, one where the expenses are higher than the income and you make a loss. Yep. And a question out of the gate that people might be wondering is, well, why would anyone ever want to buy a negative cash flow investment if it makes a loss? And the answer is because some people want to speculate or take the chance that the amount the property goes up in capital gains will be more than the amount that they lose because the expenses are higher than the income. Yeah. And that's also particularly so because when it comes to negative gearing, the Australian Taxation Office will give you a tax deduction for the amount of the loss that you make. And so people who are proponents of the negative cash flow strategy, negative gearing strategy, say that here's a way for the tenant and the tax man to buy the property for you. Now, that's all fine. And that is a legitimate legal way to invest. It's great for some people, but it wasn't great for me. Yeah. Now, why wasn't it great for me? The answer to that was, I wanted to be free from my accounting job. I used to work as an accountant selling my time for money. And so I asked myself this question before I'd even bought any property. How many negatively geared properties do I have to own in order to be financially free? And that immediately blew up the strategy of negative cash flow because I needed my job more, not less, with each negatively geared property that I bought because I needed to fund the loss out of something and that fund was going to be lost out of my job. Yeah. So instead, I've focused on positive cash flow property as my vehicle to get to financial freedom. With every property that I've bought, adding a little bit more positive cash flow to eventually getting to the point at age 32 at the time where I no longer had to work for money. 
Now, how many properties did I have to buy? Well, it was me and my business partner, Dave Bradley at the time. And the answer was about 130 and it took us three and a half years to buy it. So what a good name for a book <laughs> from naught to 130 properties in, in three and a half years. So that kind of answers the question about positive cash flow and negative cash flow in a very simple way. I'm a very simple guy. I like to explain things in simple concepts. Perfect. So for whom might positive cash flow be suitable? Well, for those people that want to replace their income that they they receive from selling their time with another form of income and therefore to get financial freedom. Continue to work if you want to, but not because you have to. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted control back over my time. Now, I don't have a Ferrari parked in the driveway and I don't have a yacht parked down at the marina. It was never about materialism for me. It was about control of my time so I didn't have to work. And that might be interested to know was because my dad worked very hard in the one job for 40 years plus. And I saw my dad give the best years of his life to something he didn't enjoy doing. Yeah. And I didn't want to do the same thing. Yeah. So can you still buy positive cash flow properties? Absolutely. Any property where the income is higher than the expenses will be positive cash flow. Yeah. What complicates it is the amount of money that people borrow. So if you're saying to me, I want to borrow 100% of the purchase price of a property and I want it to be positive cash flow, I would say you'd have about as much chance of that as me waking up with a full head of hair tomorrow. The answer <laughs> is very little to none. But if you were to say, I want to buy a property and I don't need any debt, then I'd, I'd say, well, the chances are very good that it will be positive cash flow. But you need to learn how to do the numbers. And a lot of people don't know how to do the numbers. They're a bit afraid of maths or if they've never been taught. So if you don't know how to crunch the numbers on a deal, then engage an accountant or someone to help you, but better still learn how to do it for yourself. The problem comes, Bushy, like I said, the more you borrow, the more interest you've got to pay, the more principal you've got to repay, and that can push you into a negative cash flow situation. Yeah. Yeah, extremely well said there. Well, if we, if we look at cash flow properties then in the current context, uh, are there any risks and limitations in uh, looking at that opportunity as we stand? Yeah, well, the biggest danger at the moment is rising interest rates. And if rents aren't going up, but interest rates are going up, then the amount of cash flow that you, you get from your investments being squeezed. And in Australia, we can inoculate ourselves to a certain extent by fixing the interest rate. But then when we come off a fixed interest rate period, we might find that rates have reset to a higher level and our positive cash flow has become neutral or negatively geared. So what I say to people and, and the way that I advocate investing, and I don't know that I hear too many other people talking about investing this way, is use residential property for growth and then trade or leapfrog it as you build your capital base. And then when you get to a point when you're ready for income, then swap out of residential into commercial because, and ideally debt-free commercial. The commercial properties that I own, I mean, my portfolio today, people might be surprised to learn it's three properties plus a giant investment in the fund that I run. Yeah. And those three properties are all commercial properties owned for income. And they bring in more than half a million dollars of net income and they have zero debt on them. So to me, it doesn't matter what happens to interest rates. They can go through the roof or they can fall through the floor. It makes no difference. Yeah. So coming back to what can kill your positive cash flow on an income side, rents going down or vacancy, no rent at all. Yeah. Or on the expense side, your expenses going up, interest rates. Uh, management fees, holding costs, ownership costs, those kind of things. And then, of course, you've also got the risk of a value slippage. If prices start going down, then just as all ships float on a rising tide, all ships sink on a falling tide as well. So they're the three things that you have to manage as, a, as an investor. Yeah, I love it. So uh, th there's often a, a, a discussion around uh, cash flow or capital growth. Uh, and you know, th th there's a lot of commentators who talk about, well, if you if you buy for cash flow, you're not likely to get that. What, what's your view on that? Are, are, are cash flow properties likely to enjoy capital growth? I might have made that mistake before I'd even owned a property, Bushy. I had a friend come to me one day and say, "What do you think about investing in Ballarat? Whatever you do, don't invest in regional areas. You'll never get any capital growth." And I was only repeating what someone had told me. I didn't know that to be a fact. That was just what someone had said. And then I talked my friend out of investing in Ballarat. And then three or four years later, guess where I was buying properties? 
Latin, right. in the rat, Ballarat. And they went up in value. So I don't believe the, the, the mantra that you'll only get capital growth in the city. You won't get it in the country. But I have an entirely different way of viewing capital growth. Can I share it with you? Yeah, absolutely. Because a lot of people buy real estate and hope for capital growth. I buy real estate and expect capital growth. Well, how can you expect capital growth? And the answer is, well, before I buy a property, I think about who's going to buy it off me. And I ask myself these really important questions. Why will they pay more for the property than I did? On what basis will they pay more? And how do I make it appealing for them to buy? Yep. Now, people think that houses go up in value. Houses don't go up in value. Houses go down in value. They depreciate, right? The only thing that goes up in value is what someone believes that property is worth. So if you can sit distant to the asset that goes down in value and think, why will someone pay more for it than me? How do I use my investing skill to bring something to light that doesn't exist at the moment to increase its value greater than the cost of increasing its value to make a margin, then that's how I make my profit. So I don't buy a property expecting the market to go up. It'd be great if it does, it's gravy on top, but I buy for capital growth because I buy problems and sell solutions and use my investing skill to fix things. And that to me is the art of investing. Love it. I absolutely love that, mate. Uh, a lot of people, when I've, some some people have leveled this criticism of me. It's, you know, it's, it's easy for you guys because when you did it all those years ago, it was much easier and everything else. So I'd love to put this question to you. If, if you were starting out again now, in what, how and where would you invest? It's interesting. There was an article I wrote which appeared on news.com.au or they featured me for an interview. And I was reading some of the comments at the bottom of that interview, Bushy, and it was like, what a pile of rubbish. You're such an entitled boomer. Imagine trying to get started today with interest rates where they are and property prices where they are. And I read that and I thought to myself, what a bunch of bollocks. People are always talking themselves out of things. They're always looking at why they can't do something rather than why they can do something. Yeah. And it was not easy buying real estate in 1999 when I got started. And how many people, Bushy, do you know who bought 130 properties in three and a half years? Do you think that was easy? There's only one and that's you, mate. And my wife and I, we made some pretty big personal sacrifices while all our friends were out buying homes and moving on to their dream homes. Jules and I, we lived in a freezing cold borderline slum rental on a main road in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne in Box Hill South. It was, was not a pretty thing. Yeah. So what I what I would say out of the gate is reassess your expectations. Everyone always thinks it was easier yesterday and it wasn't. Yeah. Every generation has its own challenges to face and today's generation is no different and tomorrow's will be no different again. But here's what I would say if I was to start out again today, I'd ask myself the same questions that I start that I was asking back when I got started. It's not a question of where and it's not a question of what. To me it's a question of how and a question of why. What outcome am I trying to achieve? And how can I engage in real estate in a way that's going to achieve that outcome? And it might be buying apartments in some little regional city uh, in, in some far off destination. It might be buying and trading properties in Australia. I think the New South Wales change to the way land tax and stamp duty are working is going to provide a great opportunity for people to flip houses whereas before the, the cost of stamp duty and transacting real estate limited that. Yep. So there will be opportunities that will open up uh, that people who can think creative can, can take advantage of. One of my sayings, Bushy, is that as long as people live in houses, you can make money out of real estate. And I firmly believe that to be true. Yeah, so right. what I would do is I would maximise what I did have and minimise what I don't have. And so if I've got the skill to be able to find good deals, but I don't have money, then I would partner with someone who had money but couldn't find good deals to re-establish my capital base. And then what I would do at the end of the day is do what I do today. I'd build up that capital base and I'd move on to commercial property eventually where a dollar of rent is plus outgoings, whereas in residential, a dollar of rent is including outgoings. So I think the smartest people I know play Monopoly in real life. They start by renting properties, four greenhouses, one red hotel, 
start by renting, move on into valuating, end up in commercial. Just play Monopoly in real life. It's worked for me. Yeah, I love that, mate. Uh, and you got a beautiful way of summing it up in in a fashion that we we get straight off the bat. So I really want to thank you for these awesome insights, as always, Steve. And thanks for your generous time again on the show today. You're very welcome, Bushy. Thanks, Steve. Well, as Steve is famous for saying, and he just mentioned it then, as long as people live in houses, you can make money in real estate. So it's never about when, because the best time is always now. It's more a question of how and why to secure properties that make money from day one, because you don't want to be a property buyer who dabbles in investing. You need to be an investor who uses real estate, which is another great quote of yours, Steve. And if you want to enjoy more of Steve's words of wisdom, make sure you have a listen to our recent deep dive two-part conversation on Get Invested. They can hear now on novafm.com.au forward slash podcast, forward slash property hub, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you're serious about living a, a lasting legacy, that'll make a positive dent on the world and the lives of others, make sure you also grab a copy of Steve's latest bestseller, Money Magnet, that you can get now on moneymagnet.au, where you'll also find a whole bunch of bonuses. Or you can get your copy from all good bookstores. You're enjoying Australia's longest running and most popular property show here on Realty Talk. Successful property investment is a game of finance. Do you have the right team and the right game plan? Realty Talk is brought to you by Know How Property. More than mortgage brokers, Bushy Martin and his team of investment architects set you up with a sustainable strategy structured to lower your costs, tax, risk and stress while increasing your capacity for growth. Know How has helped over 1,900 homeowners and investors secure more than $800 million in property wealth. So get set to live more, work less, and live your legacy. Want to know how to invest in your freedom? Visit knowhowproperty.com.au. Now, before I leave you, here's a final thought from me. There's been a lot of negative Nelly gloom and doom in the mainstream media about the upcoming mortgage cliff in the months ahead, as the 40% or so of property loan borrowers who fix their loans at historically low rates during COVID, progressively jump to the current variable rates that are now double to triple what they were back then. Now, this may sound scary, but if you're smart enough and proactive enough, now's the time to do something about it by giving yourself a repayment parachute if you haven't done so already. Now, don't make the mistake of waiting until your fixed rate expires before considering your options, because by then, it may just be too late. Now, why do I say this? Because you may get caught in a pincer capacity move where you won't be able to do anything but accept the doubling or more of your home loan repayments that your current bank or lender will revert to when your fixed rate expires. This is because your loan borrowing capacity will have reduced significantly with each and every past and future interest rate rise to the point where you may no longer be able to borrow the amount of your current home loan, which means you'll have no choice but to accept your current bank's standard variable rate at the end of your fixed rate period. And this reduced borrowing capacity risk will only get worse if rates continue to rise. Now, as a rough example, on an average $600,000 home loan, for every 1% rise in rates, the average borrower's lending capacity drops by about $100,000. And we've already seen rates rise by over 3%, which means a $300,000 drop in achievable borrowing capacity or the amount that you can actually borrow. And for those of you living in areas where property values have dropped by up to 8 to 13% since the peak at the end of 2021, like some areas in Sydney and Melbourne, this may also mean that you've now in expensive lenders mortgage insurance territory, where rates, costs and lending restrictions are much higher and tougher. Or worse still, yeah, you may there may be some of you who've borrowed the maximum when property prices peaked, and now your loan balance may be getting close to being higher than what the property is actually currently worth, which means that you're in negative equity territory and you won't be able to do anything but accept the significant jump in interest rate payments that your current bank then imposes on you. So here's the catch-22 where you're 
a little bit caught between a rock and a hard place. If you leave it until just before your fixed rate expires, you may no longer have the ability to refinance to a cheaper loan from the 40 odd lenders and over 2000 different loan alternatives available from a good finance broker. And if you refinance now while you're still able to, while you won't be hit with big fixed rate break costs because rates have actually increased since you locked your loan in, your repayments will increase earlier than they need to, but are likely to be a lot less than if you wait until the death now. So let's look at a quick example. Let's say you've got a $600,000 home loan with the Commonwealth Bank that you fixed in at 2% until the middle of this year. Your principal interest repayments on this are about $2,200 a month. If you wait until your fixed rate expires and you no longer have the borrowing capacity to refinance, then your loan rate will revert to the standard variable rate at that time, which is currently about 8%. So assuming that rates don't increase further, which they are, are actually likely to in the short term, your repayments would jump up to $4,400 a month or double your current repayments. But if you refinance now, if you're still able to, you can still secure discounted variable rates from some lenders at around about the 4.75% mark, plus some really generous cashback incentives of up to $4,000 from many lenders, meaning that your repayments will be about $3,120 a month. Now, this is a reduction of $1,280 a month or over $15,000 a year. And that's equivalent to a work pay rise of about $22,000 a year once the tax is factored in. Just by refinancing now while you can, rather than leaving until later and running the risk that you can't. So what do you need to do? Well, here's my suggestion. Reach out to your mortgage broker, or if you don't have one, Give the team at Know How Property Finance a no obligation call and get them to run your numbers in order to determine the sweet spot of what's going to be in your best interest based on your personal situation so that you can take the best action at the best time to minimise your costs and your risks. Making that simple call now could save you tens of thousands of dollars. So don't delay, do it today. And remember that the secret to getting ahead is actually getting started. That's more food for thought. And that brings us to the close of this week's show. Another big thanks to our guests, Kate Bakos, Pete Wargent, Michael Roger, and Steve McKnight. And before we go, make sure you don't miss another episode of your trusted voice for all things property by subscribing to Property Hub on your favorite podcast player now, where you'll also enjoy the Get Invested podcast delivered to you each and every week. Thanks again to realty.com.au, BMT Tax Depreciation, Apiro Marketing, and DM Media for their ongoing support. I'm Bushy Martin from Know How Property Finance, and along with Kevin Turner and the entire Property Hub Realty Talk team, we thank you for getting invested in yourself by investing in us. And I look forward to seeing you again next week. Miss something in this week's show or want to catch up on past shows? Do it anytime at realty.com.au where we connect buyers, sellers, and agents differently. 